Hey, this is Sketchy. We're a learning company and this podcast is a review of the material meant to be used in tandem with our videos, quizzes, and symbol explorer to help the lessons stick. Or use this to passively review a topic while you're on the go. Check out the link in the episode bio to watch the video that goes with this podcast. All right, let's get started. So far in this chapter, we've been talking about high blood pressure, hypertension, antihypertensives, and hypertensive emergency. But we're all done with that. The rest of this chapter will focus on low blood pressure, shock to be exact. So let's leave the early 20th century behind and swap out that old school Titanic for an aircraft carrier in the sky. We're heading to the Shock Force Command Center. If you haven't seen shock yet, don't worry, you will. Not only is it a common condition on the inpatient wards, it's also one of the most frequently tested concepts on exams. In this sketch, we'll review the basics of shock, including the clinical presentation of undifferentiated shock, as well as the initial approach to a patient presenting with shock of unknown etiology. In parts two and three of this series, we'll do deep dives into each of the four main types of shock. Let's begin, as we usually do, with an overview of the basics. Shock is defined as a state of tissue hypoxia due to an imbalance between oxygen delivery and oxygen utilization. At Sketchy, shock is represented by our recurring symbol, the lightning bolt. Perfect logo for the shock force, don't you think? Specifically, tissue hypoxia can be caused by inadequate oxygen delivery to tissues, excessive oxygen consumption by tissues, or inadequate utilization of the oxygen delivered to the tissues. Either way you slice it, the tissues are not seeing enough oxygen. Or as the shock force sees it, the tissues are being terrorized by Hypoxos, the supervillain lord of oxygen, or uh, lack thereof. That's why he's blue all over. Oh no, Hypoxos has kidnapped a member of the shock force. Looks like he was too much for her fragile constitution to handle. But let the fact that she's passed out remind you that hypotension is the most common manifestation of shock. Notice how she's wearing a blood pressure cuff on her arm? Hypotension occurs as a result of circulatory failure, which is the most common pathophysiologic mechanism behind shock. Shock is initially reversible, but it must be recognized and treated immediately to prevent progression to irreversible end organ damage. As you might remember from PATH class, there are four major types of shock, hypovolemic, distributive, cardiogenic, and obstructive. Let's check out our first member of the shock force, Aegir the Norse god of the sea. His weapon of choice? A sponge hammer. Awesome. What are you gonna do? Clean hypoxos to death? Actually, that might work. I don't know. Egeer represents hypovolemic shock, which results from decreased intravascular volume, represented by his low water tank, that in turn leads to decreased cardiac output, hypotension, and shock. Next up, everyone's favorite billionaire playboy genius, Cardio Man. It's exactly who you were thinking, right? Anywho, notice his cracked heart reactor? That's a recurring sketchy symbol for cardiogenic shock. Hmm, must be an early Mark I prototype. Cardiogenic shock results from intracardiac causes of pump failure, which in turn leads to decreased cardiac output, hypotension, and shock. Can you guess who the third member of shock force is? Yep, you got it. It's Captain Shield. I assume you guessed Captain Shield. The captain's trademark lightning shield is a recurring sketchy symbol for obstructive shock. In contrast to cardiogenic shock, obstructive shock results from extracardiac causes of pump failure. Think of the causes of obstructive shock, which we'll cover in part three of this series, as obstructing the flow of blood into the heart. Finally, we arrive at the final member of shock force, the distributor. Clearly the anchor of the team, am I right? Anywho, he represents the fourth and final type of shock. Distributive shock. Distributive shock is characterized by severe peripheral vasodilation, represented by the distributor's big red arms and legs. All that vasodilation leads to a significant drop in systemic vascular resistance and, consequently, blood pressure, since BP is equal to cardiac output times SVR. So, hypotension is easy enough to recognize. However, sussing out the specific type of shock is a bit tougher. That's where Sketchy comes in. We use the term undifferentiated shock to refer to situations when shock is recognized, but the type and etiology are still unclear. Check out parts two and three of this series for all the deets on the four different types of shock.
For now, though, let's take a look at the clinical presentation of undifferentiated shock, since it's what you'll often be asked to identify on exams and, just maybe, the wards. Unfortunately, and not surprisingly, patients who present in shock are critically ill. Therefore, obtaining a history from the patient will frequently be very hard, if not impossible. We'll talk about the specific risk factors and etiologies of the different types of shock in parts two and three of this series. For now, let's move on to the characteristic exam findings you'll see in shock of any type. We mentioned this earlier, but it bears repeating. The vast majority of patients with shock will have hypotension. Okay, that said, patients in early stages of shock can be normotensive or even hypertensive. So hypotension is not required to diagnose shock. Most physicians focus on the blood pressure when evaluating patients with suspected shock, and rightly so. However, don't neglect the heart rate. Tachycardia, represented by a recurring sketchy symbol, the heart watch in Hypoxo's hand, is an early compensatory mechanism in patients with shock, often manifesting before overt hypotension can be detected. The lungs don't want to be left out of the party either. Make sure to check that respiratory rate. Tachypnea, represented by our recurring symbol, the stopwatch overlying our victim lady's chest, is an early compensatory mechanism for metabolic acidosis, which occurs in shock as a result of lactic acid buildup from a lack of oxygen in the tissues. The first thing you should do in the examination of a patient with undifferentiated shock is look at the hands. In hypovolemic, cardiogenic, and obstructive shock, peripheral vasoconstriction leads to pale, cool, clammy extremities, a phenomenon known as cold shock. Capillary refill time in cold shock will also be prolonged. In contrast, distributive shock is an example of warm shock, in which peripheral vasodilation leads to warm, well-perfused extremities and a rapid capillary refill time. Another sign you may notice on exam is altered sensorium. Mental status changes, represented by that caricature of hypoxos with confused googly eyes, in shock is usually caused by decreased brain perfusion, which is why there's a knife stuck in his brain. Altered mental status can range from agitation to confusion, obtundation, or even coma in its severe stages. Another finding that's sensitive for shock is the presence of oliguria, represented by these yellow drips of coffee coming out of that kidney-shaped coffee machine? At least I hope that's coffee. Way past the blonding point there, guys. Oliguria occurs in shock due to decreased kidney perfusion, which is represented by our recurring sketchy symbol, the cracked kidney-shaped coffee machine. There are a bunch of other exam findings to look out for in patients with shock, but they'll differ depending on the specific type of shock. We'll dive into those findings in detail in parts two and three of this series. For now, let's move on to some of the lab abnormalities you'll see in patients with any type of shock. And continuing on with our theme of kidney injury, if you notice oliguria in your patient, chances are good that they'll have laboratory findings of acute kidney injury. These include an elevated BUN, represented by our recurring sketchy symbol, the BUN bun bag, and an elevated creatinine, represented by our recurring creatinine credit card. I sure hope no one's paying for that quote-unquote coffee, unless they're like into that sort of thing. Who am I to judge? One frequent lab finding in shock of any type is metabolic acidosis, represented by these bubbles of acidic lemonade in that picture. Once again, are you sure that's just lemonade in there? I don't trust you guys anymore. Primary metabolic acidosis manifests with a pH below 7.4 and lower than normal bicarbonate levels on an arterial blood gas. That's why we've drawn our recurring sketchy symbol for ABG, the red syringe, into this acidic lemon pitcher. Such a hardcore stir stick. Love it. In shock specifically, that primary metabolic acidosis will be associated with an elevated anion gap. Represented by this beware of gap sign. Safety first, shock force. The anion gap is elevated in cases of metabolic acidosis where there's an increased presence of organic acids, lactic acid specifically in the case of shock. To learn all about how to interpret ABGs, check out our ABG how-to sketch in the fluids, electrolytes, and acid base unit. Speaking of lactate, we also frequently order levels in patients with suspected shock. An elevated lactate level, represented by this carton of lactate milk way up on the highest shelf, is a sensitive marker for the diagnosis of shock. It's also associated with increased mortality in patients with shock. When it comes to shock, one unique diagnostic test you'll frequently see in test questions, but rarely on the wards, is pulmonary artery catheterization. Also known as the Swan-Gans cath or SWAN, a PA cath can give us lots of useful physiologic information to help us figure out which type of shock the patient has.
Unfortunately, because of how invasive a PA cath is, it's rarely used in real life outside of the ICU. PA caths give us four very useful pieces of information. Cardiac index, a standardized version of cardiac output, systemic vascular resistance, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and mixed venous oxygen saturation. Let's see how each of these values vary in the four different types of shock. First up, hypovolemic shock. In hypovolemic shock, the cardiac index may be normal or decreased, depending on the severity of hypovolemia. Since the main issue is a lack of volume, the heart can compensate by jacking up the heart rate, to a point. Eventually, the heart just can't beat any faster, and at that point, cardiac output will fall. To help you remember that hypovolemic shock is associated with decreased cardiac output, check out Egir. He's underneath the broken cardiac spotlight, our symbol for decreased cardiac output. Systemic vascular resistance in hypovolemic shock will be increased, which is reflective of the body's compensatory mechanisms for decreased cardiac output. At Sketchy, increased SVR is represented by these tight red shoelaces on Egir's boots. Pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is a proxy for the pressure within the left atrium, which itself is a marker of fluid overload in the left ventricle. As you might expect then, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be low in hypovolemic shock since there's definitely no fluid overload anywhere in the body. To represent low wedge pressure, we've drawn an Egir's small yellow wedge weapon worn low on his body. Finally, mixed venous oxygen saturation, aka SVO2, in hypovolemic shock will be low. SVO2 is measured in the pulmonary artery and represents the oxygen saturation of blood after it's made an entire circuit through the body. A low SVO2 then means more oxygen is being extracted from the blood as it moves along, which tends to occur when cardiac output drops, like it does in hypovolemic shock. To help you remember that hypovolemic shock is associated with a low mixed venous O2 sat, just check out this mixtape deck worn low on Eger's belt. What? You gotta have your tunes when you're out saving the world. Guarantee he's listening to Eye of the Tiger. All right, let's move on to cardiogenic shock. Can you guess what the four PA cath values will be? Since we're talking cardiogenic shock, it's a safe bet that cardiac output will be decreased. Hence why Cardio Man is also under the broken cardiac spotlight. As a result of the decreased cardiac output in cardiogenic shock, the body attempts to compensate by increasing systemic vascular resistance. Hence the tight red laces on Cardio Man's boots. Not sure why your metal boots need laces, but more power to you, C-Man. So far, cardiogenic shock's looking awfully similar to hypovolemic shock, but we're about to bust that wide open. In contrast to hypovolemic shock, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure in cardiogenic shock will be elevated. Hence the large wedge worn high on Cardio Man's helmet. Wedge pressure is increased in cardiogenic shock because the failing heart is unable to keep pumping out the blood that's coming in. As a result, volume overloads the left ventricle, backing up into the left atrium and ultimately the pulmonary capillaries. Lastly, mixed venous O2 sat will be low in cardiogenic shock as the decreased cardiac output forces the tissues to extract more oxygen from the blood that is passing by. Hence the mixtape deck worn low on Cardio Man's belt. Time to turn to Captain Shield. What would a PA cath look like in that guy? Well, since obstructive shock is caused by pump failure, extra cardiac, in contrast to cardiogenic shock, cardiac output will be decreased, which is why Captain Shield is also standing under the broken cardiac spotlight. Similarly, the decreased cardiac output in obstructive shock stimulates the body to compensate by jacking up systemic vascular resistance, represented by those tight red shoelaces on Captain Shield's boots. When it comes to pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, though, obstructive shock can be a little tricky. That's because in certain cases of obstructive shock, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be normal or low. These are most commonly pulmonary causes such as PE, pulmonary hypertension, and tension pneumothorax, which is why Captain Shield's small wedge is worn down low here on his belt, next to his lung-shaped torso pack. Functional yet stylish. In cardiac causes of obstructive shock, such as cardiac tamponade, constrictive pericarditis, and restrictive cardiomyopathy, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be increased. Hence this large wedge worn high on Captain Shield's mask right by his heart-shaped cowl. Some things you can't unsee. Luckily, the mixed venous oxygen saturation in obstructive shock is not nearly as complicated. It'll be decreased as a result of the decreased cardiac output. Welp, we saved the most interesting superhero for last distributive shock. Distributive shock is one weird cat, 
which kind of makes sense, seeing as how the distributor looks uh, different from the other members of Shock Force. The primary physiologic abnormality in most cases of distributive shock is abnormal peripheral vasodilation. As you might expect, then, SVR in distributive shock will be decreased, represented by these loose red shoelaces on the distributor's high tops. As a result of the abnormally low SVR, the heart races to maintain a normal blood pressure by cranking up cardiac output as much as possible. As a result, the cardiac index in most cases of distributive shock will be normal to increased. However, the heart can only do so much to compensate for a bottomed out SVR. So in severe cases of distributive shock, the cardiac index will actually be decreased. In addition, in neurogenic shock, a very specific type of distributive shock, the heart is actually unable to compensate because the autonomic pathways that would signal the heart to work harder and faster are broken. Therefore, the cardiac index in neurogenic shock will also be decreased, which is why the distributor is holding his own comic book, complete with our recurring sketchy symbol for neurogenic shock, outside of the bright cardiac spotlight. Since there's nothing wrong with the heart itself in distributive shock, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be normal to decreased, represented by the small wedge worn low on the distributor's belt. Lastly, because of the increased cardiac output in distributive shock, mixed venous oxygen saturation will be increased. Hence the distributor holding his mixtape deck way up high. Apparently, he's the only one who got the memo about psyching yourself up before the big fight. All right, you've taken a brief history and performed a physical exam on your patient with hypotension of unknown etiology. The labs are cooking. What do you think might be going on? Well, interestingly enough, when you see a patient with undifferentiated hypotension and signs of shock, the differential becomes the four types of shock and their potential etiologies. And that's the focus of parts two and three of this series. Make sure to check them out after we're done here. Let's summarize the clinical presentation of undifferentiated shock in a sample assessment statement. Mr. Doe is a 58-year-old homeless man brought to the ED by EMS for altered mental status. No other information is known about him. His vital signs are significant for a BP of 88 over 50, heart rate of 130, respiratory rate of 24, and pulse ox of 88% on room air. He appears agitated, is disoriented, and is unable to answer questions on exam. Capillary refill time is normal. The physical exam is otherwise unremarkable. Rapid bedside point of care testing is significant for a BUN of 30, creatinine of 2, normal H and H, pH of 7.2, bicarb of 16, and a base deficit of 12. Based on these findings, I'm most concerned for shock in Mr. Doe. We alluded to this earlier, but it bears repeating. Shock is a life-threatening condition that should be managed as you're performing your evaluation. While you're working up the patient for the underlying etiology, there are a few points of management that you should be pursuing as well. First and foremost, remember your ABCs. The absolute first priority in the management of shock, and really any patient, is to stabilize the patient's airway, breathing, and circulation. That means intubating the patient if needed, applying supplemental oxygen, and establishing IV access for medication and fluid administration. Speaking of fluids, the first line of treatment for undifferentiated hypotension and shock is IV fluids. That's why this helpful employee is filling up the ABC electric truck with a big jug of, uh, water? Wait a second. Ugh, Brighton! Your approach to fluids in a patient with undifferentiated shock should be a pattern of give a bolus, assess for blood pressure and perfusion response, and repeat. It's worth noting that the total amount of fluids you'll need to give depends on the severity and type of shock so there's no specific goal volume to keep in mind. We'll get into the details of fluid resuscitation for each type of shock in parts two and three of this series. If IV fluid boluses aren't enough to improve your patient's hypotension, the next step up involves vasopressors. Represented by a recurring sketchy symbol, the air compressor filling up one of the truck's deflated red tires. Even more so than fluids, the use of pressors really depends on the specific type of shock. For example, vasopressors can actually be harmful in patients with hypovolemic shock. We'll cover the pressors in greater detail during our deep dives into each of the four different types of shock. Stay tuned. Finally, after you've stabilized the patient, then it's time to perform a focused evaluation to identify the etiology of your patient's undifferentiated shock. To remind you that gathering more information should only be done after you've stabilized the patient, We've put in all this surveillance equipment inside the ABC electric van. Gotta make sure the van can run before you can use all the stuff inside, after all.
Be sure to check out parts two and three for an in-depth look at the questions to ask and findings to look for to elucidate the underlying type and cause of shock. Alrighty, let's finish up part one with a brief overview of what we've learned. Shock is a life-threatening state of tissue hypoxia that's most commonly caused by circulatory failure, which manifests as hypotension. There are four types of shock, which we'll get into in much greater detail in parts two and three. Hypovolemic, cardiogenic, obstructive, and distributive. Undifferentiated shock refers to the situation where shock is recognized, but the type and cause is unclear. Regardless of the cause, most patients with shock will present with a similar set of signs, hypotension, tachycardia, tachypnea, altered mental status, and oliguria. In addition, shock will also produce a unique set of lab findings, abnormal renal function tests, an anion gap metabolic acidosis, and elevated serum lactate levels. PA cath measurements can tell you a great deal about the specific type of shock your patient might be facing, but in reality, it's mostly used on exams and in the ICU due to its invasive nature. Here's a recap on how the different PA cath measurements shake out in each of the four different types of shock. Don't worry, this won't be the last time you'll see this table. As soon as you've made the assessment that your patient is in shock, it's time to spring into action. Always remember ABCs first. Stabilize the patient's airway, breathing, and circulation before you do anything else. IV fluid resuscitation is the first line of treatment of undifferentiated hypotension and shock. Only if aggressive fluid resuscitation doesn't improve the patient's perfusion or adverse effects like fluid overload are seen, should you add on vasopressors to restore adequate tissue perfusion. Finally, after you've stabilized your patient, start working them up for the underlying type and etiology of shock which we'll cover in the next two sketches. Trust me, you don't want to miss what happens when the shock force heads out from their hover fortress and starts fighting the bad guys. Check out our other topics on YouTube or go to sketchy.com for our full suite of MCAT and med school lessons. Thanks for listening and stay sketchy out there.